Hello and welcome to this lecture on emotions. Emotions are a component of attitude, stress, and burnout. And they range on two different dimensions from highly negative to highly positive and anywhere in between. And the other dimension being high activation to low activation and anywhere in between. Well, let's get started. Here we have what is called a circumplex model of emotions. So what we've done here is arranged a variety of different emotions that human beings experience on the perimeter of a circle. And we can organize this circle along two axes. On the vertical axis, we have something called activation. And this ranges from tranquil to astonished. It's the degree of activation, a tranquil emotion is much lower in activation than is an emotion of astonishment or fear or elation. The horizontal axis is called evaluation or sometimes referred to as pleasantness and it simply ranges from negative evaluation to positive evaluation or negative pleasantness to positive pleasantness. And so we can see that sadness and boredom and fear are negative emotions and positive emotions would be elation, cheerfulness, and contentedness. So what we have is a way of looking at how different emotions are related to each other. On the perimeter of the circle, we have a variety of different emotions. And yes, there are many, many more emotions that human beings experience. But we can see that sadness and fearfulness are very similar to each other. So is boredom and tranquility. The opposite of tranquil is astonished. The opposite of boredom is elation. The opposite of cheerful is sad. And so opposite of each other on the perimeter of the circle is the opposite emotion. Now, if we look at these axes of activation and evaluation, we can carve this circumplex model into four quadrants or four pieces of the pie. And here in the top left, we have fearful, astonished, and sad. And those would be high activation negative emotions. The top right quadrant, high activation positive emotions would be elation, astonishment, and to a slighter degree, cheerfulness. Bottom right quadrant, low activation, but still positive emotions. Being contented is very positive, but it's a much less lower activation than is elation. And on the bottom left, we have low activation negative emotions like boredom um, and tranquil and sadness to lesser degrees. So we can also insert a variety of other emotions on this model. And let's just think of one, say, anger. So ask yourself, is anger a high activation or a low activation emotion? Definitely a high activation emotion. You realize within the first millisecond that you are angry. So it would be in either the top left or top right quadrants here in the high activation zone, high on the vertical axis. Now, anger, would that be a pleasant, a pleasant or negative emotion? Well, it's definitely a negative emotion. So we're talking about placing anger somewhere over here between astonishment and sadness. In my opinion, anger would probably go somewhere on the periphery of this circle between fearful and astonished, probably at about 11 o'clock, so to speak on, speak, on the clock face there. So anger is definitely a high activation emotion, and it is a negative emotion. Now, let's rethink that. Perhaps anger would go best over at this section at, say, 10 o'clock. So now, is anger a very negative emotion? Well, it depends on how it's channeled. And is it a moderately low activation emotion? Uh, I'm not sure. So it goes somewhere in here around fearfulness. And that's where we could place anger. So let's talk about the relationship between emotions and other things, other 
different longer lasting emotional states. And here we have a model that arranges emotions, moods, and affect. So at the very bottom in the green circle along the horizontal axis, we see that an emotion is a fleeting or transitory physiological reaction to something. It doesn't last long. It occupies a very small amount of time on the horizontal axis. And also, it's not exactly, uh, doesn't go well from one situation to another. We can really enjoy chocolate ice cream and have a pleasant emotional, positive emotional reaction to chocolate ice cream. And five, minute la five minutes later, when we walk out of the ice cream store and we step on gum on the sidewalk, then the, all that positive emotion associated with chocolate ice cream goes away. So emotions don't last long and they don't travel well from one situation to the next. However, mood does last longer. It spans a longer amount of time on the horizontal axis, and it does transition well across more situations. So if you wake up in the morning and you're in a bad mood, you may be in a bad mood when you pick up your morning coffee. You might be in a bad mood when you start work. Heck, you might even be in a bad mood at the end of the day. The next day, are you likely to be in a bad mood? Maybe not so much. The moodiness tends to go away, doesn't last as long, but travels across more situations. This highest level here called affect is a dispositional tendency towards similar emotional reactions across most situations and during most time periods. So here we have affect occupying the most amount of time on the horizontal axis and occupying the most number of situations on the vertical axis. So when we think of affect, it's almost like a personality trait. And many people think of affect as ranging from high positive affectivity to low positive affectivity or even as high negative affectivity. There's been a lot of research on whether or not negative and positive affectivity are just polar opposite endpoints of the same unidimensional spectrum. And the evidence suggests that they are not. The negative affectivity and positive affectivity are two different things. And while it may seem hard for us to understand how one could be highly negatively affective and highly positively affective at the same time, in some rare individuals, it can happen. So think of affect as akin to being permanently pleasant or permanently negative. The classic video example of this would be the Saturday Night Live skit starring Rachel Dretch, where she plays someone called Debbie Downer. And Debbie Downer is very strongly negatively affective. Everything that Debbie talks about, experiences, conveys, or just generally finds herself in has some sort of a negative uh, uh, connotation. And what happens when we're around people who have strong levels of negative affectivity is it tends to bring us down a little bit as well. But Debbie can't help it. This is a dispositional predilection towards negative emotional states across most situations and for extremely long durations of time, and in her case, probably for her whole life. So now we've arranged emotion, mood, and affect on two different axes, one associated with the amount of time and the other associated with the number of situations. So let's explore now the relationship between emotions and attitudes and, of course, behaviors. So attitudes have three different components. They have beliefs, feelings, and behavioral intentions. So each of these three components is really, really important. So beliefs are sometimes, sometimes referred to as cognitions. These are, this is the cognitive aspect of an attitude. If we're able to say, I love chocolate ice cream, 
How do we know we love chocolate ice cream? We know we have a cognition, a belief about chocolate ice cream because we've had it before and we really enjoyed it. Now, feelings are sometimes referred to as the affective component of attitude. And so this is a conscious, positive, or negative evaluation of the attitude object. If we can say, I love chocolate ice cream, the love part of that statement is the affective component of the attitude. Thirdly, we have the behavioral intentions, sometimes just referred to as the behavioral component. And this is the planned motivation to engage in a particular behavior regarding the attitude object. So all attitudes have an object or a target. We have attitudes about things, about political candidates, about food, about coworkers, about cars, about music. And you often hear people kind of use a bit of a misnomer when they say, oh, she's got such a bad attitude or, oh, he's got such a horrible attitude. Well, it must be an attitude about something. So let's go back to the chocolate ice cream example. If you can say, I love chocolate ice cream, you have cognitions about it. You know you love it because you've had it before. You have a strong affective re reaction to it because you say you love it. And guess what? Your behavioral intention is to buy some chocolate ice cream sometime in the near future. Heck, you may go buy some right away on your way out of here. The problem is that all along the way of these cognitions and affective states and behavioral intention components, we're peppered with different emotional episodes. So let's say, for example, you do go and buy some chocolate ice cream at the local convenience store the next time you're out of the house. And you open up the container and you look inside and there's a cockroach in the chocolate ice cream. Disgusting. Oh my gosh. Now you have a negative emotional affective reaction to chocolate ice cream. And you may not be able to even look at chocolate ice cream for a while. In fact, you may not be able to say with strong gusto that you love chocolate ice cream. You might say, I used to love chocolate ice cream till I bought that ice cream and it had some had a cockroach in it. Now I find chocolate ice cream disgusting. So all along the line, we have these emotional episodes which pepper the various stages or components of an attitude. Now, behavioral intentions often, but not always, lead to specific behaviors. So there's a moderate to strong correlation between an intention and a behavior, but it's not a perfect relationship. So many people have the intention of losing weight at the local health club starting January 1st with their New Year's resolution. They intend to go to the gym, but do they all? No. And in fact, many gyms make most of their money for the year in that first month, capitalizing on strong behavioral intentions, which are never seen to fruition. So here's another example. Let's say you have a, you want to evaluate two candidates in a political debate. And one of them makes a very offensive comment about a group of which you are a member. This produces a very sharp, short-term emotional reaction, one of disgust. So our attitude towards the candidate was previously, and now still may be, one of disdain. Because we believe or think that the candidate is prejudiced. We feel that prejudice is wrong, and we intend to vote against prejudiced persons. After the disgusting comment, we not only vote for the other candidate, but we actively campaign against the offensive candidate. So we have an attitude about the candidate because we believe the candidate is prejudiced. We feel that prejudice is wrong. We intend to vote against the candidate and actively campaign for the candidate to lose. So all of these things comprise our attitudes towards the candidate. So next we'll turn to something a little bit different, but still related to emotions in general, the concept of emotional labor. So emotional labor is an interesting thing. It's the effort, the planning, and the control needed to express organizationally desired emotions during an interpersonal transaction. 
I know that sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo, but think about it. Emotional labor is hard work. Actors are involved in high levels of emotional labor. They must portray a specific emotion at a very specific time. Think about Disney World employees as well. Think about a costumed Disney World employee who's forbidden to speak while in costume. And as they roam around the Disney World grounds, small children are tugging on their costume and you know, uh, causing all sorts of uncomfortableness for the costumed employee. Yet, the employee must always act in a very cheerful, pleasant manner, always being willing to take pictures with children who may be crying or spitting up or what have you on their costume. And they must portray the proper emotion at all times. That's hard work. It's also harder work when the job requires frequent and long duration display of emotions. So um, Broadway actors tend to have to display long duration display of emotions uh, for, you know, a two or three hour stage production. And when they get off of the stage, they're just totally drained. When they have to display a variety of emotions, that can be problematic as well. And when we have to display more intense emotions, for example, a call center employee who's being chewed out by an irate customer who must be ever so pleasant in the face of such verbal derision that they just can't stand it anymore. Nevertheless, their job requires that they react in an emotionally appropriate manner. Now, there are, of course, very great differences between cultures and emotional displays. Some cultures expect people to display a neutral emotional demeanor with minimal emotional expression and a sort of a monotone voice. This is common in many of the East Asian cultures and in countries like Austria. And now other cultures allow or encourage emotional expression where emotions are revealed through voice and gestures. And this would be countries like Italy and Kuwait, Egypt, Spain, Russia. Those people are expected as members of the culture to be very expressive with their emotions. And a classic example of this is the Oscar speech by Roberto Benigni when his film won the best Oscar for an international film uh, for the movie was called Life is Beautiful. When he won, he didn't walk down the aisle calmly to the stage. He jumped up and down and screamed in his chair and walked over the seat backs to the stage and hugged Sophia Loren just mightily as she gave him the Oscar. Someone from Japan or Korea would probably never react that way. Their culture simply says this is inappropriate to display this sort of emotion. Now, we also know that there are there's something called emotional contagion, which is an interesting concept. This is using an affective response to suggest understanding or recognition of the speaker's intention. So when someone is telling you a story and it's a sad story, you tend to have a sad face. So you're saying to the storyteller, I recognize this is a sad story. I recognize you're having sad emotions about the story, and I too am experiencing sadness. And there's a great Saturday Night Live skit with Taylor Swift on some sort of a uh, an interview show where the interviewers are giving over-the-top facial expressions, trying to indicate to her as she's speaking that they understand the emotions that she was going through as she tells her story. Well, let's move on to something else. Emotional intelligence. This is the ability to perceive and express emotion, to assimilate emotion and thought, to understand and reason with emotion, and to regulate emotion in oneself and others. Now, does this come from nature or nurture? Well, we're not really sure. Some of it is is probably innate and hereditary, and much of it is learned. Probably the majority of it is learned. If it wasn't a learnable skill or ability, 
then there wouldn't be numerous training opportunities for people to improve their emotional intelligence. One of the problems here with emotional intelligence is that it's sort of a fuzzy construct. We're still not sure exactly what it is. While there are some instruments that are designed to measure it, those instruments tend to have some psychometric issues associated with them. And we're not quite sure how emotional intelligence relates to other key constructs. So emotional intelligence may be a bit of a misnomer. If we think of intelligence as an, a largely innate ability to solve problems, but we recognize that emotional intelligence is a, a learned skill or ability, then intelligence may not be the best way to refer to it. But we do know that it ranges in a hierarchy from lowest ability to highest ability. And at the very highest, we have relationship management, slightly beneath that social awareness, just beneath that self-management, and at the very bottom, self-awareness. So self-awareness is the first stage. Unless you have mastered self-awareness, you cannot rise up to self-management and the other levels. This is understanding your own emotions, your strengths, your weaknesses, values, and motives. Think about a very small, very young child, a toddler, let's say who is having some sort of a hissy fit in a store. And the mother asks the child, why are you so angry? And the child says, I'm not angry. And the mother says, but you're acting like you're angry. And the child, if the child had enough verbal fluency to express its emotions verbally, properly, it would probably be able to say, huh, I didn't realize I was angry. So people who have very low self-awareness express emotions and they're unaware of those emotions. They're unaware that they're acting out those emotions. After we become aware of these emotions, then we step up to the second level, self-management. So this involves a bit more maturity and it involves controlling or redirecting our internal states, impulses, and resources. So if you're in the workplace and uh, you go to the lunch room and you've prominently written your name on your lunch and you go in and someone has eaten your lunch, you may get very angry. Are you going to have a hissy fit like a two-year-old in the middle of a department store? Probably not. You're going to be able to manage those emotions. So now you're at the second level of the EI hierarchy. After you've been able to properly manage your own emotions, you then rise to, and only then, rise to the third level of social awareness. And that's being aware of and understanding and being sensitive to the feelings, the thoughts, and the situations of others. Only after we are aware of our own emotions, after we've attain the ability to control them, only then can we truly and properly become aware of what others' emotions are. So if someone is, is having a bad day and we go up to them and say, I think I know what's bothering you. Could it be such and such? And they say, yeah, how'd you know? It's because we are highly socially aware. And we know that person and we understand emotions in general. Now, at the very top of the hierarchy is relationship management, and this involves managing other people's emotions. This is the very highest level, and this is something that top leaders in organizations have to have ample amounts of. Think, for example, of an instance where an employee comes to the CEO's office and says to the CEO, that son of a gun, Joe, makes me so angry if he tells me one more time that he's going to blah, 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 I'm going to punch him. I am going to punch him straight in the mouth. Well, a good CEO with high levels of relationship management might say something like this. Well, Bob, I understand that Joe has made you angry. Heck, he makes me angry too. He makes a lot of people angry, but he's an important part of the organization. And you know what, Bob? you're an even more important part of this organization. So let's see if you can, you and I can sit down and figure out a way to convince Joe not to do the sorts of things that he's doing anymore, that other people don't like it when he does those things, that you don't like it, and that I don't like it. And then we won't have to deal with Joe's behaviors anymore, and he won't make us angry anymore. How does that sound, Bob? 
Bob says, wow, well, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, let's go do that. And so you two march off down the hallway to go find Joe and have a talk with him. So now you've been able to manage Bob's emotions and hopefully properly manage Joe's behaviors. This is what makes for a good leader in an organization. Hey, let's turn now to one of the most studied job attitudes of all time. Job satisfaction. So job satisfaction is simply one person's evaluation of their job and their work context. It's really a collection of specific attitudes about specific facets of the job. So here at the center, we have job satisfaction being comprised of satisfaction with job content, satisfaction with supervisor, with coworkers, with working conditions, pay and benefits, career progress, etc. And there are other facets as well. So this is kind of a conglomeration of these things. And this can be thought of as a sort of a compensatory model. So maybe we really do not like our supervisor, but we really love our coworkers. So being very satisfied with coworkers and not at all satisfied with our supervisor could offset each other. And we could be moderately at least satisfied with our job. Now the relationship between job satisfaction and job performance is sort of reciprocal. One causes the other and then that one causes the first one and it goes in a sort of a circle. We know that happy workers are somewhat more productive workers, but we also know that a general attitude is a poor predictor of specific behaviors. Here we're, we're referring to what's called the specificity matching principle. So we think of specific behaviors like showing up to work on time or getting our TPS report in by five o'clock on a Friday. A general attitude like job satisfaction may be only very, very weakly related to those very specific behaviors. We also know that job performance affects satisfaction, especially when contingent upon or depending upon the rewards that we receive. So the combination of high levels of job performance and high rewards will make us happy with the job. Now, job satisfaction and motivation in general have very little effect on jobs over which we have very little control. Think of an assembly, an assembly line, for example. On an assembly line, you know, we may not like our job so much, standing there by the conveyor belt, doing the same thing time after time after time, day after day, month after month, year after year. We may not really enjoy that very much, but we tend to be able to perform that job well. So in certain jobs, there's absolutely no relationship whatsoever between job satisfaction and job performance. Now, we also know, of course, that job satisfaction and customer satisfaction are related. So if we are happy with our jobs, customers tend to be happier with the jobs that we perform for them. And customer satisfaction and profitability are very strongly positively correlated. So just in general, job satisfaction affects our mood, which leads us to engage in positive behaviors towards customers. So when we have high levels of job satisfaction, we also tend to have lower levels of employee turnover, resulting in a more consistent and familiar service. So when our employees are happy, they tend to not quit the job. Thus, our customers tend to interact with the same employee time and time again. And that makes most customers pleased to not have to deal with new employees every time they go back to the company. So what do we do when we're dissatisfied? Well, when we're dissatisfied, we have four different reactions. This is called the EVLN model, and it's a response to dissatisfaction. So at the very top, one of the options, and this is not a hierarchy, these are just four different options that we have, is exit. We can leave the situation, or we can quit or transfer. So maybe we don't like what we're doing in our job. Our job it just does not make us happy. 
you know what? We quit, go to work for another company doing something else. Maybe we talk with our supervisor and say, you know, I'm not really happy doing this. Is there something else I could be doing for the company? And so that would be a transfer. Another option would be voice. We can seek to change the situation. We can engage in problem solving and complaining. So if we're unhappy because of a policy that our organization has, we can ask to have it changed. Loyalty involves just patiently waiting for the situation to improve. And some people will choose this as an option when they're dissatisfied with their job. They say, in essence, well, it's not going to be this way forever. If I hang in there, things will change and it's worth hanging in there for. So I'll just remain loyal to the organization. The last option, the N in the EVLN model here is neglect. And so with neglect, we can begin to do a very poor job. And this may be conscious or unconscious. We, if we're unhappy in our job, may tend to be absent a little bit more. We may perform the job more carelessly. Um, we may be tardy. We may call in sick when we're not really sick. We may just generally tend to neglect what it takes to do the job well. So exit voice, loyalty, and neglect. Now here's an example from popular culture. Most of us have probably seen the classic movie Office Space. And we have several characters in this movie who are dissatisfied with their jobs, obviously. And so one of them would be uh, the character played by uh, um, uh, Rachel from Friends, I forget her name. Um, and she's the waitress at the, the local restaurant. And so when she gets very dissatisfied with her job, very dissatisfied with her boss, she flips him off with the middle finger and quits on the spot. That's exit. Now voice, that would be the character of Milton. So he's dissatisfied with many facets of the company operation, uh, by, like being moved from worse office to even worse office time and time again. He's particularly dissatisfied with his missing stapler. And so he often expresses his concerns to anyone who will listen, but no one ever does. So he's engaging in voice. Then there's loyalty. So the characters of Samir and Michael Bolton, uh, they're dissatisfied software programmers who simply do not enjoy their job, the company, or the way they're treated. However, they just seem to be riding it out, keeping silent and somehow hoping miraculously for conditions to improve at some point in the future. So they're, exist they're uh, um, um, showing loyalty. And then we have, lastly, neglect. And this would be Peter, the star of the movie. He's extremely dissatisfied with his job. So he starts just showing up whenever he feels like it. He's very apathetic about his performance. He refuses to answer his boss's phone calls. He takes naps at his desk. He's engaging in neglect. And so different people may choose different ways of dealing with dissatisfaction. So job satisfaction is one of the most studied job attitudes of all time. Let's turn to another one. And that would be organizational commitment. An organizational commitment is really comprised of three different dimensions. We have affective commitment. And this is, this is not a hierarchy. These are three independent dimensions, which are at least lightly correlated, positively correlated with each other, but not necessarily strongly correlated. So affective commitment is the emotional attachment or identification with or involvement in an organization. If you can make the following statement, I love my company, you're expressing affective commitment. You strongly identify with the company, you have a strong emotional attachment to it, and you're likely to be heavily involved in the organization. The second dimension would be continuance commitment. This is a calculated attachment based primarily upon self-interested motives. Here we calculate that it's simply too costly to leave. So you might say to yourself here, for example, I hate this job, but there aren't a lot of other options right now. A lot of people are losing their jobs. It's a rough economy out there. So I'm going to stay here. I have calculated, in essence, that the cost of leaving 
is not worth it. I may not be able to find another job. So I will remain somewhat committed to this organization. And the last one here is called normative commitment. And this is when you have an obligation to remain with the organization, largely because it's just the right thing to do. So some families uh, kind of instill this in their children. We Millers never quit. When we start something, we finish it. That would be a normative commitment here. You might be saying in essence, I'm committed to do this job. I gave this company my word I would do the job. I will see it through. So you can have varying levels of affective continuance and normative commitment, and they may change over time, largely in a, as a result of company policies. However, there is a predisposition towards certain levels of commitment. So there's a variety of organizational manipulations and interventions which can improve commitment for some employees. Having clear grievance procedures, treating people with dignity and respect, clearly linking pay to performance, being transparent with decisions, etc., etc., can all improve commitment, at least a little bit, for most people. However, there is a tremendous dispositional influence on commitment, and we cannot change people's dispositions or personalities, except maybe over the course of a couple of decades. So some people will simply never be committed to an organization, no matter what. So much of commitment comes from within, but most of it is a result of organizational policies. So now we've clearly discussed emotions and at least two of the major attitudes that drive specific behaviors in an organization. So let's turn our discussion to something different. Stress. Stress is just an adaptive response to a situation that is perceived as challenging or threatening to the person's well-being. So here we have what's called the general adaptation syndrome. This was developed by Hans Selye. And uh, Selye says that there are three stages that we go through as we try and cope with stress. The first stage is just an alarm reaction stage. This involves basically physiological responses and it's a very short-lived duration. We could, if we wanted, put time on the horizontal axis. And so we start with time zero. And as we experience a stressful situation, we have a physiological response to it. And our ability to cope with stress is diminished from this green line, which is essentially just our own natural ability to deal with stress. And so, for example, uh, let's say we have a boss who comes into the office and starts screaming at us. Within the first few minutes of this experience, we have a physiological reaction. We may start sweating a little bit. Our heart starts to race a little bit. Sometimes we're just so shocked that we can say nothing. We think to ourselves, what the heck? I've never had somebody scream at me like that in the workplace. What do I do now? So we're in that alarm reaction stage. And then we enter into stage two, into the resistance stage. And in the resistance stage, we tend to increase our ability to cope with stress. So this yellow line goes from a negative ability up to a positive one. And we start to think, well, this person is sort of a volatile person and I had a feeling they were going to act this way before and you know what it doesn't bother me too much I can handle this I can cope with this level of stress but eventually after going through this stage of resistance for an exceedingly long time we entered the exhaustion phase and of course this if left unchecked and unresolved can result in long-term physiological and psychological damage. This is where we actually start to experience 
burnout and other things like that. So this green line here is the normal level of resistance. And the green line is different for everybody. The green line might be here for one person and it might be way down near the bottom for someone else who just cannot deal with any amount of stress. And the green line for others is up here near the top of this vertical axis. And this is where these people can deal with anything. Nothing phases them. So the green line is different for everybody, the normal level of resistance. The path of the yellow line is different. Some people don't dip below their normal level of resistance very much. Some dip a little bit, but not for very long. They enter the resistance phase quite quickly. Some have a much longer stage two. Some have a very short stage two. And so they may enter stage three right about at the midpoint of this horizontal axis. So there's a variety of different things here that can affect our ability to adapt to a stressful situation. Well, this would kind of suggest that perhaps all stress is bad. But actually, all stress is not bad. We must be able to differentiate between bad stress and good stress. So let's take a look at that. We have something called eustress and we have distress. And so on the vertical axis here, we have performance level and the horizontal axis is the amount of stress. So as we progress from the origin of this graph, as we encounter more and more stress, just enough stress, we start to have higher levels of performance to a certain point. There's a point where the stress level approaches diminishing returns. And so at a certain level for everybody, the stress level becomes so great that it decreases our performance level. So think, for example, about a tight deadline on the submission of a report. Well, a lot of us work better under some sort of a deadline. So by giving us a deadline, it allows us to set a series of goals for ourselves. And we need just a little bit of a goal and a little bit of stress in order to perform at a high level. But if the deadline for submission of the report is unrealistically soon, that might be so much stress that we actually perform very poorly. If the stress level is way out towards the end to the far right of the horizontal axis, well then, we have too much stress and we have near zero performance level. And so this vertical line separating the eustress region, noted as E, and the distress region, noted as D, varies for everybody. It might be to the left and it might be to the right for different people. And the shape of the red curve up to the point of diminishing returns might be differently shaped for everyone as well. For some people, the decline in performance may not be so steep. Maybe it is drawn way, way out, nearly flat for a long, long time until finally the stress becomes insurmountable and it just crashes down to the horizontal axis at a point of zero for performance level. So some stress is good, but too much stress is bad. Well, let's spend a little bit of time talking about some aspects of the workplace that cause stress for, that cause distress for everybody. Sexual harassment. Well, there are two different conditions that sexual harassment has to have. It has to be either severe or pervasive. And sexual harassment is simply an unwelcome conduct having detrimental effect on the work environment or the job performance. So if an employee um, happens to you know, have a, a, a naked picture on the uh, screen of their computer for a fleeting second and someone sees it, it may be considered unwelcome and have a detrimental effect on the work environment, but it may not be severe, okay? Um, if the employee watches porn movies at lunch in their cubicle with the sound turned up to be completely ludicrous, that would generally be severe 
course, this is open to what they call the reasonable person approach. And that's why we have judges, juries, and lawyers to decide these things. And so that might be severe. And if they watch these things every single day, that would then be pervasive. And so it must be either severe or pervasive, long lasting or just very, very extreme. There are two types of sexual harassment, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. So quid pro quo sexual harassment is when employment or job performance is conditional upon the performance of an unwanted sexual act. So this is when an employee says to another employee, if you don't do X or Y for me, you'll be fired. If you don't have sex with me, you'll be fired. Well, that would be quid pro quo. That's something for something there. And that is clearly illegal, even if only offered once or, or stated once. That would likely be severe. Okay. Now, the hostile work environment is an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. And this would be like a mechanic's garage that posts uh, nude centerfolds all around. And there might be a few women in the work environment who simply find that objectionable, as most reasonable women would. And that might qualify as a hostile work environment there. And so we go to court for this as uh, uh, pr protected by the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Because generally speaking, sexual harassment is thought of as a form of sexual discrimination, and it's against the CRA 64, Civil Rights Act of 64, uh, to discriminate against people based upon their sex. Well, the Civil Rights Act of 64 only allowed for trial by judge. Now, you could also get the pay that you would have been paid if you had been hired when you applied, and the judge could force you, force the company to hire you. Well, that's fine and dandy, but who really wants to work at a company where they were sexually harassed, okay, and you were forced to quit, um, or other forms of discrimination? So the Civil Rights Act of 64 was updated by the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which then allowed primarily for two basic differences. Now you could have trial by jury, a trial of your peers. And so if this was a uh, some sort of, uh, um, oh, I don't know, racial discrimination in hiring or sexual harassment, then you would have a trial by a jury of your peers, people who may be like you. And the second major thing was that Civil Rights Act of 91 allowed for both compensatory and punitive damages. So now you could be paid for back pay in the case of discrimination upon hiring. But in the case of sexual harassment, the judge could send and the jury could send a very strong message to the company and everyone else that we don't allow that sort of thing and the company must pay both compensatory and punitive damages which can be extraordinarily expensive so sexual harassment is a really big issue in the workplace it's something that should never happen and companies typically have very strict policies against it. They should all have some sort of a procedure for reporting it in the employee handbook or the policy and procedure manual, etc. And these things should be followed very, very strictly. Now, there was, of course, a couple of classic court cases, only one of which I want to relay to you here, and that would be Meritor Savings v. Vincent. And in this case, in a nutshell, a man and woman had a consensual sexual relationship and the relationship ended, which is why we should probably never have relationships with co-workers because, frankly, most of them don't work out. And so this relationship ended and then the woman applied for a job and was uh, a promotion and was denied the promotion and thought perhaps that it was because she was being discriminated against because of her refusal to engage in the formerly consensual sexual relationship. Well, she sued the company and the company said, we don't even know you guys were having a relationship. How can we be held liable for this? And the court said, aha, you must be aware of what your employees are doing. So this has now given rise to policies in companies where 
if you engage in a romantic relationship with a coworker, you may be required to report that relationship to the Human Resources Department. And there was a classic TV episode for the Office TV show where Michael Scott was having a relationship with his supervisor and she brought him to HR and had him sign some paperwork acknowledging that they were having a relationship. And he um, idiotically referred to it as the so-called love contract. He thought it was a contract that she was making with him when actually she was just abiding by uh, the policy of the company, which required that she report those sorts of things. So let's move on. There are a variety of different individual differences in our ability to deal with stress. People have different threshold levels of resistance. If you recall the horizontal dashed green line from Hans Selye's general adaptation model, that particular green line may be very low for some people and very high for others. And these things just differ for different people. We also have different coping strategies. Some people have a, a developed a network of people who help them deal with strategies. Maybe it's a romantic partner, a spouse, a parent, um, a member of the clergy that they rely on. And so we all have different coping strategies. Some of us have so-called coping strategies, which tend to make matters worse. Relying upon alcohol to deal with stress has never been a good strategy. Some people find that it helps them deal with stress in the short term, but in the long term, it always has adverse consequences. And some people just have different personal or competency differences. These particular competency differences involve different knowledge and skills. Some people have learned how to deal with stressful uh, issues. They know how to do these things. They've, they have the skill that helps them deal with them. Others simply have a natural optimism. If you think of our, our uh, um, discussion of positive affectivity, people who are naturally optimistic, people who are a glass half full sort of a person tend to deal fairly well with stressful situations. For example, they may encounter uh, an auto accident on their way home from work and they get out of the vehicle and they say, gosh, at least nobody was hurt. Now that stressful event may evoke an entirely different reaction from someone who has no natural optimism and has a strong negative affective disposition the negatively affective person might jump out and scream and flail about and oh my god what's going to happen to me next everything's going wrong and so that would be someone who does not deal well with stress we also have resiliency some people just bounce back better than others and this is likely some sort of conglomeration of other traits Perhaps high levels of extroversion and emotional stability, a strong internal locus of control, a tolerance for ambiguity, and high levels of self-esteem. These things all tend to comprise personal resiliency. People who think highly of themselves look at stressful situations as just a short little, uh, short little downturn in the trajectory of their life or a small nick in their armor that can be easily mended. People who have high levels of emotional stability tend not to experience emotional reactions too strongly. They don't have a lot of anxiety about stress. Internal locus of control would suggest that people who experience stress tend to say to themselves, well, I'm the master of my domain. I can handle this. This is just something life has thrown me. It's a curveball and I can handle it. Now, we also have something called type A behavior. Type A behavior involves being fast paced and fast moving and hard charging. These are people who have behavioral indicators like walking fast or talking fast or finishing other people's statements for them. These are type A people. Type B people are really more laid back. They tend to deal better with stress. Type A people tend to experience more cardiovascular health issues. They tend not to deal as well with stress. And type A behavior people tend towards workaholism much more strongly. 
So workaholism is a real issue for type A people, and workaholics tend not to deal with stress as well as people who are maybe not so workaholic. Well, let's explore something different. The job burnout process. Here what we have is a variety of interpersonal and role-related stressors which cause us to proceed through a series of stages. Now, most of the stressors in our job are interpersonal. Most of the stress in our job comes from other people, not from the duties that we have to perform in our job. It's the people we work with that cause stress in our life. Now, each of these stages has a horizontal arrow leading from stage one to the green box, which has physiological, psychological, and behavioral consequences. Stage two has a much broader, deeper, thicker arrow, meaning the likelihood of moving or experiencing consequences as a result of being in stage two is very strong. And then if one proceeds to stage three, the likelihood of having negative consequences is almost a certainty, thus the much thicker, darker, bolder black arrow. Okay, so stage one, emotional exhaustion. This is sometimes referred to as compassion fatigue. We simply just don't care anymore. We've given this job all we can, and you know what? Things aren't getting better. Uh, the job is stressing us out, and you know what? We just give up caring. That's unlikely to lead us to very pronounced physiological, psychological, and behavioral consequences. But if we proceed to stage two, cynicism, also sometimes known as depersonalization, where we tend to treat people like objects and we have total indifference, then we're likely to experience, we're more likely to experience some negative consequences. So an example of cynicism would be like nurses who no longer refer to patients by their names, but rather by their maladies. So it's no longer Mrs. Smith in room 324. It's the broken leg in 324. It's the gastric bypass surgery in 278. And no longer are these human beings. Now, stage three would be reduced efficacy. Sometimes this is referred to as reduced personal accomplishment. And with this, we tend to have exceedingly diminished confidence in our personal abilities. So if we proceed to reduced efficacy, then we are likely to have very severe physiological, psychological, and behavioral consequences. Think about a job that has a very strong burnout rate prison guard. In the beginning, we care mightily about the prison and the prisoners. Eventually, we no longer care about the job. We no longer care about the prisoners. We stop referring to them as inmate Smith, and now they're in the inmate A2178, right? And now we even begin to believe that, you know, we can't do this job anymore. This job is killing us. So what happens is we start to experience cardiovascular distress, um, weight gain. We start to have uh, all sorts of psychological issues associated with it. We're depressed. We hate our job. And then we even begin to perform the job more poorly. We have severe behavioral consequences. We forget to lock up one of the cells. And maybe an inmate kills another inmate because of us because we have started to experience the highest level of burnout. If you make it to stage three, there's two things you have to do. You have to get professional counseling if you've made it to stage three, and you have to take time off from work to recover from burnout. So counseling and time off can help some people recover and rejuvenate from burnout. Think about the uh, TV show Law & Order Special Victims Unit. After working endless hours on a case about a horrible sexual crime where a victim was just, just really, really brutally victimized, the detectives are often told by the captain of the Special Victims Unit, go home, take some lost time. Now, if they've also fired their gun and maybe killed a perpetrator, then they are required to take time off and they're required 
by their job to seek counseling from a, a counseling psychologist or psychiatrist who works for the police department. So this is such a serious issue. They get counseling and time off. Anytime an officer fires their gun in the line of duty, whether or not they hit a human being or kill a human being, they're immediately put on desk duty until it's investigated. Now, if they kill someone, then they also have to do the counseling thing. Okay, because this is a very serious issue. So if you think you're experiencing job burnout, you may see yourself start to progress from stage one to stage two. That should be a big giant red flag. Maybe you should seek some counseling early so you can avoid reduced efficacy or this last stage, sometimes known as reduced personal accomplishment. Burnout is a big issue and it's detrimental not just for us, but also for our coworkers and our customers and other people who interact with us 